We are Pro Cannabis Media. Four former U.S. Attorney Generals flew out to California, including Bill Clinton's Attorney General. And they held a press conference. And they called medical cannabis Cheech and Chong medicine. Mm. Yeah, right, okay? So now, I want to go to all of the families who have epileptic children who are not getting seizures anymore. I want to go to all the families of cancer patients whose tumors stopped growing. I want to go to all of the family members of Alzheimer's patients whose symptoms were alleviated. I want to go to all the sufferers of arthritis who can use their hands again, right? Cheech and Chong medicine? Turns out it works pretty damn well. That's the voice of Steve D'Angelo from Harborside Vertical in California, where he's been called the father of the cannabis industry. Now, Steve D'Angelo is the founder of The Last Prisoner Project. He joins me next on In the Weeds with Jimmy Young. Don't look now, but it's a whole new world of weed out there. Pot is flower, it's Bruce Banner and Blue Dream. You've got bongs and dabs, resin and shatter, vaping and edibles, new terms, new strains, and new ways to use cannabis sativa, the plant. Some just made with CBD, and hemp has minimal THC. There's sativa and indica strains, and 100 chemicals, all legal in 10 states for adult use. There's a lot to get to know. Get used to it, folks, because it's legal in the Bay State and it's not going away. Neither is In the Weeds with Jimmy Young next. Revolutionary Clinics is just one of 49 medical cannabis dispensaries in Massachusetts, but there's a reason why it's one of the most popular. It's their patient-first philosophy. All day long, they teach, they educate, they communicate about this complicated plant called cannabis sativa. That's true. Whether you visit their Cambridge location in Fresh Pond at 110 Fawcett Street or at 67 Broadway in Somerville. Revolutionary Clinics, where the patient comes first. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another special edition of In the Weeds with Jimmy Young on location at Canex in Montego Bay in Jamaica. And who am I joined with here but the one and only Steve D'Angelo, known as the father of the cannabis industry. Does that make you feel accomplished? Does it make you feel good? What, when you hear that name, does it make you feel respected? Well, you know, the cannabis industry existed for many centuries before I came along. So I'm not the father of the cannabis industry. I am the father of the legal cannabis industry. Willie Brown, uh, the former mayor of San Francisco and speaker of the California Assembly, uh, gave me that designation. Just, you know, I got one of the first six cannabis licenses. I was very, very lucky that were issued in the United States. I've had the opportunity to kind of be here uh, from the beginning and contribute to the building of it. Um, I, I take it as a great honorific. I'm, you know, I'm really proud of what we've done to, to build a legal cannabis industry. And uh, to be recognized for having played an important role in that is, it feels really good. And I know you feel real good about the latest project that you're involved with, the Last Soldier Project. Tell us a little bit about that. I'm familiar with it, and I am on record of saying I am going to help you in Boston because of Sarah. Great. Well, Sarah is amazing. She's the executive director of the Last Prisoner Project. And our mission is really simple, right? We want every single cannabis prisoner on the earth to be released. Every single prisoner. And uh, our reasoning, well, our reasoning is that it never should have been a crime in the first place, okay? And they never should have been locked up. But beyond that, we now today are living in a world where there are people who are making huge amounts of money with cannabis legally. And uh, uh, unfortunately, most of these people are people who have a heart, who actually really care. And so there's an opportunity for the legal cannabis industry to help all of the prisoners who are still in prison. And, and we're beginning to see that happen, and the project is, ta is getting traction. We've been really fortunate to get support from some 
Some people are really key in the history of cannabis. So Damien and Stephen Marley have joined our advisory board. Uh, the uh, Peter Tosh Foundation, Nyambe Tosh, uh, have recently also become supporters of... Another Boston connection. Another Boston connection, yes. I know you didn't have a good experience with the Globe and the Herald. Okay, I get that. But not too many people do, by the way. But... It's still a good town. Yeah, yeah. No, look, I was warned that politics in Boston is a contact sport, yes. right? <laughs> sports, politics, and revenge, actually, is what the mantra is. Uh, an old sports talk show host that I used to emulate, Eddie Andelman, just coined that. Let's go back to The Last Prisoner Project. You're taking on not just The Last Prisoner in America, but you really want to bring this internationally. Yeah, because the, the, we have a responsibility, okay, especially Americans. The reason that cannabis has been prohibited all around the world is because when we retired Harry Anslinger as the commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, he jumped over to the United Nations and spread his poison all over the world. Okay? So, um, yes, it is, a, it is a global problem, and the industry, the legal industry, is now a global, a global industry. We have cannabis being cultivated and, and, and consumed and sold legally in Europe, in Africa, in South America, in North America, and now in Asia. Thailand and South Korea are both moving towards medical cannabis. So it, it, as long as there is a legal cannabis industry, then I think that we have this incredible opportunity to use a tiny little bit of the money that comes from that industry to, um, to implement a little bit of restorative justice. Absolutely, and here in Jamaica, I, I'm, I've certainly got an education about um, how inbred the, it is in the culture here with the Rastas, um, and I love their message of one family, one humanity, and how they engage with this live thing, the cannabis sativa plant. It's, it's fascinating. Well, what you see with, with Rastafarianism is the results of multi-generational experience with cannabis. And what that does is it, is it builds a new kind of value system and ultimately a new kind of culture that lives by those values. The interesting thing is the values of Rastafarianism are basically the same values of cannabis consumers all over the world, anybody who has a relationship with this plant is most likely, not universally, but most likely to be open-minded, to be tolerant, to respect nature, to resolve disputes in a peaceful way, to place value on joy and happiness and togetherness and experience with each other. Now, these are common values that we live by, uh, um, uh, a desire for individual freedom and a suspicion of authority, right? We share these values no matter where we are in the world, and there's hundreds of millions of us, hundreds of millions of us all around the world. And I know in Jamaica now, they've decriminalized it. They're starting to come out of the, I don't know, out of the fields and make it all legal, and um, the farmers are concerned They've been doing this for generations now. They don't want to miss out on this opportunity. You know what goes on in this island better than I do. It, is there a space for them? Is there a place for them? Well, there better be. Yeah. There better be, okay? Uh, again, this is, this is a question of a moral imperative. Prohibition was wrong from the beginning. Okay? The people who had the courage and took the knocks to carry this plant through those long years of prohibition are the first people that should be in line to get legal licenses, not the last people. They should not be excluded. And again, the, the legal cannabis industry, people who have mainstream business experience have an obligation, I believe, to reach out and make sure that these legacy farmers are included in the industry. And I hope that that happens, and I'll do everything that, that I know how to help make it happen. Presence obviously that makes it happen. Um, in your panel yesterday, I I learned very a lot from you. I listened to you, and I've learned quite a bit from you. I was shocked a little bit about the talk about the Safe Banking Act, where historically and in the NCIA and in the whole nation, this was a historic moment that the United States House of Representatives at least voted something positive mm -hmm. for a new industry. But you're not so sure that is a good thing. 
No, no, it's a good thing. Okay, good. Absolutely a good thing, no question. I'm a big supporter of the however, Safe Bank. However, however, they, they addressed this subject in an extraordinarily convoluted way, okay? Because at the same time that they passed a law saying that nobody could take enforcement actions against banks who provided services to state legal cannabis businesses, they failed to do away with the law in the first place, right? So there is still a law in the books, anti-money laundering law, that says that any financial institution which takes dollars from an organization that handles a Schedule I controlled substance is liable for money laundering charges, and the individual bankers, the human beings, can be arrested, prosecuted, and imprisoned on conspiracy charges, which can carry up to 20 years in prison. So um, now Congress goes and says, all right, we're, we're not going to mess with that law that already exists, guys. But what we're going to do is we're going to press this second law. And the second law says, well, in these special cases, the first law doesn't really count. Now, you're Mr. Banker, and you're sitting there and you're going, hmm, let's see, two laws. One says I go to prison for 20 years. The other one says, well, you got an exemption to that law. But... That law that says that you go to prison has been around for a long time, and, and this other law, it, it just popped up. Me, Mr. Banker, conservative dude, I'm probably going to sit back and think about this for a little while before I jump in, and that's what I'm afraid uh, is going to happen. Hopefully I'm wrong. Hopefully the financial incentives, the huge opportunities that are available to financial institutions to come into cannabis will be so tempting that it will overcome the naturally conservative instincts of, of the bankers. I hope that that happens, but at the same time, if Congress would just grow a spine and take its head out of the sand and do what is perfectly clear and obvious and remove cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act, we wouldn't need to go through all of these crazy legal convolutions of passing laws and then passing laws that say that you got an exemption from the law that's still there. Well, you taught me that the President of the United States, I don't even like to use his name, I'm from Massachusetts after all, um, has the opportunity to make an administrative change to deschedule cannabis. My biggest fear is he's going to use that as a political ploy to get votes in September, October 2020. Where do you stand on that? Well, look, I think that, I, I don't think that Trump is gonna expend any political capital to advance cannabis reform. But I think that if Congress passes a law and it goes to his desk, he's gonna sign it. And if he signs that law, I'm gonna praise him for signing it, just like I wanna praise anybody for signing a, a Cannabis Reform Act. Um, would I vote for him? No. There's a lot of Democratic candidates that I'm not willing to vote for too, including the front runner, right? So, um, you know, I'm, I really am, I'm a one issue guy. Uh, I care more about this issue than I, than I do anything else. And uh, I will vote for the presidential candidate that number one takes the strongest reform position and number two that I can trust the most to actually follow through on that position when they get elected. I like that. That's Vote Pro Pot. There's a podcast in Washington, D.C. I'm giving them a shameless plug that does that, and that's where they started, and I know that's what drives them, too. So, uh, Steve, you know, you've been great. I know I could sit here and talk to you forever, but I, I know you're as tired. Well, excuse me, you're much more tired than I am. I, I'm not even gonna, not even going to compete, but I thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to actually know you, to get to know you. I saw you for that first time in May at the NCIA lobby days, and I knew who you were. And uh, I, it's, it's really fun that we've been able to have an opportunity to talk. And, you know, Kurt Dalton, my cohort over here, you know, the, si the silent one, the silent one's holding one of the cameras, okay? Um, he also speaks very highly of two, too. And you will always be welcome in Boston. You know, I, I know what happened. I, feel, I felt bad. I apologize for my city, you, you know, yesterday. So, um, and when I can get you that video and the sound, I promise I will. Great. Steve D'Angelo. You're terrific. What a thrill. Thank you. Thank you. For Steve and Kurt, who's behind the camera here. Oh, yeah. Look at my, hey, that's how we do it. Remember, it's a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly. Right, Steve?
Revolutionary Clinics is just one of 49 medical cannabis dispensaries in Massachusetts, but there's a reason why it's one of the most popular. It's their patient-first philosophy. All day long, they teach, they educate, they communicate about this complicated plant called Cannabis Sativa. That's true. Whether you visit their Cambridge location in Fresh Pond at 110 Fawcett Street or at 67 Broadway in Somerville. Revolutionary Clinics, where the patient comes first. In the Weeds with Jimmy Young is a production of the Pro Cannabis Media Group for the education and information of our listening audience. The opinions on this podcast are strictly those of the hosts of the program and do not represent Pro Cannabis Media or any of its affiliates. No medical advice is given and any use of cannabis should be by adults over the age of 21 and used responsibly.